Hello, everyone. Um, our next speaker is Jan Slovak, Professor Jan Slovak from Masaryk University. Um, and since we have sort of a mixed, mixed group of people here, so not only mathematicians, but also biologists and physicists, he agreed, uh, he, he agreed to give us um, a public lecture and sort of for a broader audience. And, and the title is The Geometry of Diffusion Tensor Imaging. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for the invitation and the introduction. Actually, I should start while one shouldn't start with apology about one's own lecture. It's like if you are cooking, you shouldn't say in advance to the guest that it was awful. <laughs> so, but um, I came to this topic by some accident because I, somehow I, I saw a student who wanted to work with me and, and there were, were some good reason not to reject him. and. And, and so I, I offered that I will be gladly learning a little bit. And he was of engineering background and was interested in geometric methods in, in medical imaging. And he, so I told him, well, then Sumit, it was an Indian guy. Well, Sumit, you, you have to learn some geometry and, and, and it should be interesting. Otherwise you can't defend the thesis. So he was trying to look up for something which was more difficult from the point of view of the engineers. And he found out that there is something called tensor imaging. And the point is that if you think naively about imaging, so usually one thinks about pixels on the screen, right? So you have some, some piece of plane and there you have the individual pixels and each of the pixel is carrying some information, usually some sort of scalar information. Maybe there are several scalars, right? You have the intensity and RGB to get the colored picture, right? So it's four parameters there. Whereas if you have some more complicated things to measure and, and show, then it might be that simply the data are not of scalar character, but they appear to be of tensorial character. And I will not bother the biologists what the tensors are. I will try to avoid that completely. And the point is that the typical discipline where you meet such gadgets is, is neuroscience and medical imaging showing the structures in the brain. Because the brain is, consists of two kinds of matter, the gray matter, which is in some sense, I will make, make clear later, isotropic and the the white matter, which is structured in fibers. And the medical doctors and, and brain researchers are very keen on knowing exactly how to segment the white and gray matter. And they are very keen on knowing what, how the fibers are structured there, right? Because that's, if you make a surgery, for example, nowadays the doctor first looks very carefully on the picture of the individual brain and then knows where to cut and where not to cut. So, uh, so whatever I will be talking about is based on work with this very first student of mine, Sumit Kaushik. He defended already his thesis a while ago. And by the time there were newcomers joining our team, so the Temes Gens, Segaet Bihonegen is an Ethiopian guy and Avinash Bansal is also an Indian guy. So, how does it work here? This way. So let me start with the background. So the whole thing is based on measuring the diffusion of water molecules in the tissues. It doesn't necessarily need to be the brain. It could be also muscles or, or anything else. And the point is that the people found out that if you build a very strong magnetic field, so the current machines, so the strongest one are more than 10 Tesla. The usual ones in the, what you see in the hospitals are about 1.5 Tesla or something like that. And the point is that you can, you can shoot some gradients in given directions and you can choose the frequency of your magnetic field to be exactly the one which makes only the water molecules resonate, nothing else. And if there is some activity either in muscles or in brain or wherever, 
Then of course the oxygen is burned coming by the blood vessels and it creates the water molecules and there are, they are diffusing in the tissues. And the point is that the diffusion has got different speeds in different directions in some of the tissues and has the same speed in all directions in others. So actually for the mathematicians, we work not with three dimensional brain, but we work with five dimensional blow up of the brain by two dimensional projective space of the directions, right? And that's what everything happens. And so what, what's happening in the machine is that you, you consider the brain as consisting not of pixels, but the people call it voxels, the volume units instead of pixels. And each voxel is treated in such, in such a way that centered in that position, the machine shoots the gradients of the, in the magnetic field in all directions, which means all means some high enough numbers, say 32 or 64, and they are regularly distributed over a unit sphere or something like that. And, and for each of these directions, you measure how fast the diffusion goes. And the point is that the gray matter has got the same speed of the diffusion in all directions. So that, that's the first observation. While the white matter has got only, uh, has got anisotropic behavior. Right, so that's a little bit about the background. Just to enjoy a little bit what, what, what it means, what I told. So in, in practice, you, of course, do not deal with all the individual data. And instead, you, you just do some, say, 32 or, or 64 shots at each individual voxel. And then you try to approximate the speed of, diff of the diffusion at this very voxel by something which is easily treated. And the easiest way how to, how to do it is if you try to approximate it either by second order polynomial or, the, or you try to approximate it by say fourth order polynomial. And you can imagine that, uh, so, so the picture here rather refers to Force of the second order, as you will see on the next slide. And if you if you say that the you, you would you would just like to see the, the surface where the diffusion goes from the center in unit time, then in the isotropic case it would be a sphere. In the non-isotropic case, it would be something something wild, but in the second order approximation, it would be always an ellipsoid. In the fourth order approximation, it will be some more complicated ellipsoid, right? Say a square of an area of, of a quadratic form would, would just do it. And here on the picture, so so here you see here you see a cut through the brain. The rectangle is the choice of the area which is called corpus callosum. And here is the approximation of some figures which, which are something like the ellipsoids for each voxel separately. Whereas here in the right hand part, it's, it's what, what the people call fractional anisotropy. It's the ratio of the biggest and smallest speed. So if it's, if it's uh, isotropic, it's something close to one. If it's non-isotropic, it will be much bigger than one. Right? And, and it's then displayed distinguishing the, the scalar values by the, by the colors. So you see the corpus callosum is the yellowish thing there. And it's seen just by looking only at the isotropy, anisotropy, nothing more. But that's very rough, that's not enough, right? So any questions so far? I would very much like to, to be sure that everybody is still with me in the very first uh, slide. No questions, so let's go further. So what are the main tasks? The main tasks are segmentation, fiber tracking, and also the people try to find some biomarkers. Biomarkers are some scalar entities which are independent on rotation. So because 
actually we, you don't know very well how the brain is situated in the machine so you are interested only in the scalars which are in, independent of rotations and also also a fine translation right so that's that's the biomarkers I, I will not come to biomarkers in the in the talk but let's let's look at the first two so the main tools we are having at our disposal are coming from what the people call tensor analysis or things like that but don't bother about it and let's start with the simplest modality as the engineers say and that's the so-called dti diffusion tensor imaging the diffusion tensor imaging is based on the expectation that expectation that the distribution of the speed will be well modeled by some Gaussian process, which is equivalent to the expectation that actually the quadratic approximation should be good enough. So you, you can imagine, maybe I will, I will jump there and back in the, with the screen. So if we are in the, if we were in the plane, then the second order approximation of the unit sphere, I mean the sphere where you come to in time one, say, by the diffusion, is described in polar coordinates. Perhaps you remember that from grammar school or, or which school is you have two coordinates, x and y, and you write a times x square plus b times y square, and you insist it, it should be equal one. So if a and b would be the same numbers, it would be a circle, right? Both positive. If it's both positive, A and B, but not the same ones, it's an ellipse. And it means that in one of the directions, the, the one principal axis, that's the direction where it goes fastest, whereas the other one is the one where it goes slowest, right? In three-dimensional case, again, in the special coordinates, which which are drawn by the, by the principal axis. You have an ellipsoid and you have three such vectors, right? The half axis. And again, it's coming from the formula of the quadratic form in the polar, polar coordinates. And if, if all A, B, C are positive and equal, then it would be a sphere. Otherwise it's an ellipsoid. And the diffusion tensor imaging simply tries to find the best description by a general formula for a quadratic form. So we don't know what are the polar coordinates. So you have to, you have to consider all six free parameters, A, B, C, D, E, F, in a general formula for a quadratic form, right? So it's nothing, nothing complicated. You simply have three numbers, X, Y, X. And Z, it's your coordinate of position in space. And you say that this will be so. So in our case, the X, Y, and Z are actually uh, referring to, to the change. So, so it means in, it, 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 it's the direction vector, right? It's not, it's not the position in the brain. At each voxel, I've got one such quadratic form, right? And again, as quite well known, you can write such a thing always with help of matrices. So this will be a scheme of nine numbers, three by three matrix. And you multiply the column here by the matrix so that you take the row times the column, another row times the column, another row times the column. So you get a column of three numbers and you multiply it with the row, which makes it the scalar. And if you did it, you would get exactly this formula, right? The <clears throat> now the main observation is that because diffusion is a physical process, so it must be having some positive speed in all directions. And therefore we know that the eigenvalues, so, so the directions where we keep the directions and we only might multiply the vector with, must be positive. So, and that's what, what we call in mathematics symmetric positive definite matrices, SPD, right? Now, for mathematicians, SPD are a very nice cone 
equipped with a distinguished invariant metric. We call it Riemannian space. And that's exactly what the engineers need, but only very few of them know. So this was this. So now what we are left with is to get some feeling about how we approximate, how we get the how we get the SPD matrix out of our data, right? And for that, it's again not no mathematics, it's just engineering. There is the so-called Tayskal Tanner model of how the intensity of, of, of the uh, measured data is. And you can see it here. So R is a position, it's just a position of the voxel. And you measure some <clears throat> diffusion, diffusive, some, some, some signal. The machine simply measures some signal. And there is some signal which is in absence of the gradient shot. And then there is some exponential image of this expression. Here you have the so-called diffusivity. That's how fast it is. And B is just some calibration constant, which is to be chosen and is related to the, uh, to the time exposure. So to the exposure time, how long you shoot the gradient, right? And so this is what, what the machine measures. And then of course, just taking the, the matrix logarithm, you can, taking the, the, the logarithm, you can just compute how it should be, so how, how the diffusivity would be, right? So, so in the second order, it's this one. It's exactly what I had on, on the previous slide here, uh, this one, right? So that, that's the R times matrix times R transposed, or the other way transposed. In general, if you take the nth order tensors, as we say, the difference is that you simply have a more complicated formula for diffusivity, right? Right. So you, you always have n components of the position vector to be multiplied and equipped with a constant. So there are many more constants there, right? Here? Yeah. Yeah, in the D. D is the D is the matrix. Yeah. Symmetric. Symmetric, positive S definite. What? S S of O. The first term in the formula. That's just a that's that's just the strength of the signal before you shoot the, the gradient. Because ah, there are no parameters. No, there are no parameters. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, so that's the description of what, what we can expect from the machine and what kind of data we are, we are having at our disposal. Is it clear so far? Yes, so let's go further. So let me say a little bit, so, so a few remarks on the segmentation problem, right? So I will, I will focus only two examples of very well-known techniques for segmentation because all the methods are there have been used for decades, many decades, but mainly with scalar images or, or things like that. And one of them is the so-called active contour model. And the other one is k-means. Both, both are based on good understanding of what does it mean the distance between the data related to the individual voxels or pixels or whatever you are trying to segment, right? So, so for example, if you want to segment a picture, the classical picture, you, you have to tell what does it mean that two values of the colors in the two picture, pixels are very far away or very close, right? So you, you simply work with the RGB and tell what does it mean that the colors are near and what does it mean they are far away. And then you try to detect the edges and, and the, the regions bordered by the edges, right? And so for the diffusion tensor imaging, 
which is left is only to understand the right measures. And of course, the engineers were using it their way. I mean, I mean, it, it, it shouldn't sound like I'm sort of pejorative this in the direction to engineers. It's just the other way around. They are extremely smart people who are simply really going fast to achieve the goal, right? And they don't bother about details. Only sometimes it fails. And for example, it completely fails if they say, well, it's a three by three matrix, so who cares? We've got the Euclidean norm in R9, let's use it. And of course it doesn't work because if you imagine, so, so the SPD matrices are something like a cone. And if you want to know the distance from here to here on a cone, the Euclidean distance is very much different to the distance on the cone really, right? So, so therefore, if you just employ this kind of metric, the standard techniques completely fail. Therefore, they very quickly found an ingenious way how to make it much better. And that's what they call the log Euclidean norm. And the log of the P1 and P2 are two three by three matrices, right? So, so that's two quadratic cores. And well, I mean, it's not, it's not so clear perhaps for people outside of mathematics, but the geometers know that the SPD matrices are exponential image of symmetric matrices. So the general symmetric matrices, if you hit exponential mapping, you get exactly the positive definite one, right? And therefore you have the, <coughs> you have the logarithm, the inverse mapping, and what they do is they simply, they simply make the logarithm, then employ Euclidean metrics in the logarithmic image and then they exponentiate back. And the difference in the formula is what I have got here on the second line, right? So you, you take a difference between the two logarithms, you make a square of that and you make a trace of the, of the matrix. That's the distance between P1 and P2. And it works reasonably well, but not perfect. And a more advanced method or, or more smart method is hitting the main problem of all these things because, because the main problem with all our mathematics is that it doesn't work because of the noise. So actually the machine is not showing the reality. There is something like 20 to 30% of noise always there, right? And so you have to find some good, good approximation and simplification which will kill the effect of the noise. And typically, for example, it's the reason why the canonical Riemannian metric on the space of symmetric positive definite matrices can't be used or shouldn't be used. Because if you imagine, if I go back a little bit, so if you imagine two such ellipsoids, so if they are very close to, so, so of course the canonical metric takes care of the difference between the length of the eigen of the principal axis. So if the principal axis are one of them very small, all of them are very small, and the other ellipsoid, they will be very big. Then of course the metric says that it's far away, right? But it also takes care about the rotation. And if you, if you have two, two voxels where the quadratic forms will be very close to the sphere, then of course, by the effect of the noise, they won't be spheres. And the rotational part of the information will be completely wrong, right? Because it will just tell you that they are far away, but actually they are far away, very far away, only because of the noise, not, not because of, of their real shape. So, oh, the other way around. Yes, here we are. So <clears throat> therefore the canonical metric is no good, but there is a very nice option to take what the people call the spectral metric, the spectral decomposition. And the spectral decomposition works in such a way that you simply remember from your freshman courses of linear algebra that each positive definite metric can be written symmetric one, can be written in the polar phase. So there will be some rotation U, 
the diagonal matrix filled with the eigenvalues, and again the rotation bring it back, right? So the transpose of the rotation is the inverse that it works. And now the point is that you that you simply can use the use some reasonable distance on the orthogonal group plus some reasonable distance. So here it's the same as the log Euclidean one acting at the diagonals, but the main, but the main uh, effect and, and tool you get at your disposal is that you can explicitly distinguish between those where the difference of the, eigen, of the diagonal values here in this, this capital lambda is very small. So they are all nearly the same ones. Whereas, and then you simply neglect the, the rotational part. You simply kill this part, you don't consider it. Whereas if they are very big, you, you strengthen the, the, the effect of the rotational part. And that's done by the standard tools from machine learning and elsewhere, so-called activation functions. And it's based by the it's based on the Hilbert anisotropy. So so it's so that's what the people call it. I don't know why Hilbert, but it's David Hilbert. We, we shall come to David Hilbert in a moment too. And and this is simply taking the maximal eigenvalue, so the longest principal axis of the ellipsoid, divided by the minimal one, and takes a logarithm out of that. So if the big one is the same as the small one, it will be zero. Otherwise, it will be a bit bigger than zero, right? And you, you simply make some sigmoid function, which takes care to kill the, the contribution of the orthogonal part if it's zero and, and, or close to zero, and to strengthen this part if it's big. Why, why noise affects only this middle part? Uh, no, uh, no, no, the noise affects everything except with the, with the diagonal part, the eigenvalues are simply slightly affected by the noise. Whereas, whereas the rotational part, if you take all the time the same, the same contribution just by knowing what is the angle, then it's wrong because you, you want to consider two, two things which are nearly sphere to be very close to each other and they can be rotated quite a lot. You know that by theory or by practice? It's by, no, no, it's by practice. So, so, so it's just an approach. So you can write it down, you use your, your sigma model, and then you always put some parameters there and you have to adjust the parameters for the, for the given machine, given, given type of tissues and all these things, right? So it's not a mathematical result. It's, it's just usage of mathematical tools for someone who really needs it. Well, so that's the, that's the basic data about the segmentation. So let me, let me tell a few words about the active contour method. Actually, I was splitting some of, the, some of the slides because I thought I would be scribbling over it on my computer, but then we agreed with Omid that it's better to use this local one and not to bother myself with scribbling and you with listening to that or, or watching it. So, so I will have a complete slide here so I can use it straight ahead. So the idea of the active contours is that you simply have a region and you want to segment, say, the white matter and the gray matter, nothing more, but the, but the correct way. And of course, you know that there might be as many components as you wish. So it's not just one object, right? But still you want to have a method which starts with something like a big circle around your region you want to segment. And then you start your machine and in some iterations, it should segment the thing completely. And the way how it's done is that you base your algorithm on something which the people call the edge function. And an example of an edge function is here. So you simply want a function which close to the edges would have sort of, sort of zero value and, and elsewhere will be big. So, so if you find some good variational description, which moves the curves by the gradient, like it's usually in the optimization method, you simply know how quickly some function grows and you go in the direction of this 
of the quickest, fastest growth. And, and you expect that it will stop where it doesn't grow at all, right? And so the edge function has the meaning that it stops moving the curve. And then the people use something which, which is called mumford Schach functional. Indeed, it's the famous Mumford who devoted its last two decades to imaging and, and things like that. David Mumford. Uh, and this variational function is quite complicated to describe, so I skipped that completely. But the good, the good idea behind this active, active contours, there are two actually. One is that it actually, instead of working with the curves directly, you think that the curves are, are zero level set of some functions. So you actually work with, with surfaces. And you write down the functional, you get the gradient, and it tells you how to move your surface in each iteration. And, this, and the zero, if you move the surfaces, it allows easily the zero level sets to merge or, or, or split into several curves, etc. right? So you get a very, very effective tool and it really works this way. And from the point of view of what, what I'm talking about, the only contribution, but a very essential one is that all these things are based again on similarity measures. You have to know what are some means. You, you all the time compute some means of, of, the, of the data. So, so, I mean, in our case, it would be the same DTI would be second order tensors. And you have to know what is the mean tensor somewhere and you compare it and this tells you what the gradient would be. And, and for that, you need the right similarity measures, right? And on the pictures, on the right hand of the side, uh, the slurp as Q referred there to is, is that, you know, the similarity I described working with this in the SO3, which is much faster and much more effective and, and more precise as, as shown out. And you, so, so and this is a comparison. So in the first row here, it's a comparison between the block Euclidean approach that the black curve here, the small one, and the spectral one. And the result was in, on many data, of course, it's not the, the only one. So you have to, to run the experiment on a bank of data and then, then to have some statistics about that to, to get the things published and, and to believe yourself. But it turns out that with such shapes like a circle, so this is of course synthetic data, you, you get roughly the same results except the spectral ones work much faster. So this is after, Given given number of steps, you get such a small piece of the of the object with the lock Euclidean thing, and you get that much the green one with the with the spectral metric. If you have some more, more curvy objects like this one, then actually the lock Euclidean one stops to work at all. So it, it just gets gets stabilized after some number of, of iterations, whereas the, the spectral one still gets all of the objects. Here you see the same distance, the same, the same thing. Uh, I didn't tell what the localized means here, but that's not important, so I will not go into that. But here, this is real data from the, from the brain, and you want to segment, and on the right-hand side, the, the region of interest, the, the black circle, is not homogeneous, so it shouldn't be connected. And the spectral metric just makes it right, whereas the log Euclidean fails. So it just doesn't give the doctor the, the pass to cut through, right? <laughs> so that's, that's just some rough illustration how it works. Now I will add a few words about the k-means. With the k-means, so k-means is a very classical method how to, how to segment picture 
into a given number of areas. So simply you want, you want to, it's not only about pictures, you want simply categorize some objects and you have got some big set of objects and, and you are told you have, you have to split them into four or seven or how many different categories, right? And there are, there is a very good algorithm for, for that, which is based on several steps. So, so our goal is to distribute all the voxels into given number K of classes. And what we, what we are using for that is now what the people call high angular resolution diffusion imaging, which means you are not expecting that the, that the distribution of the speeds of the diffusion is still Gaussian. And therefore you need higher order tensors, higher, higher order approximation. And, and that, that happens always if you have some fibers merging, because if you have just one fiber like that, then inside of the fiber, you simply have the ellipsoids where the long axes are in the direction of the fiber. And outside of that, you have the gray matter, which is isotropic, very easy situation, right? If you, if you have two or more fibers, either crossed or kissed like that, or merged like that, then simply it can't work, right? And the way out is to, is to shoot more times. So, so force order symmetric thing has got 15 free parameters, right? So, so if you shoot say 32 times or 64, you have enough data to approximate. And here the steps are mainly two. So first, the people exploit some reasonable projections of the fourth order tensor to the second order tensors, right? So, so you have this fourth order approximation, more detailed, 15 free parameters, and you need to, to project it down to some second order one. And of course, if you do it some straight way, for example, there are some smart methods minimizing some, some harmonic, spherical harmonics and, and, and projecting using some Laplacians. And of course, everything gets to polynomial expressions in the end of the day. It's, it's treated easily, but, but whatever you do, you lose a lot of information because you boil down from 15 to, to six, right? So, so we tried to find some, some other methods how to, how to find good projections. And in the step two, once you are already there, so you, we, we, we have, the, the, the reason for the projections is that, that you need to know some nice similarity measures. So another approach would be, which we are about to do in the next months and years, uh, you can just use the Finsler metric instead of Riemannian metric and work with the fourth order or higher order tensor straight ahead, right? So you don't have to, to do the projections, but we, we, wanted to, we wanted to use the projections or the people want to use the projection to spaces where they know about the right similarity measures, right? And that's, that's possible. And as, as soon as you do it, once you have the similarity measures, you can do the step two. And, and this is what the people call the nonlinear dimensionality reduction, which is well known from statistics, except what you have to do here is, is to, to run some minimization via what the people call graph Laplacian. So I will not go into details here. And it's all based on something which which is called the affinity matrix. So, so the affinity matrix would just take any two positions. So, so you have position one, position two, somewhere here. And you know how far they are in the normal Euclidean distance in the brain. And you also have to take into account how far are the, ten, uh, how are the data related to the individual voxels and to mix it somehow together. And, and that's quite complicated. You have to know the statistics, the, 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 the statistical behavior, the properties of the, of the things to be able to adjust the parameters of the, of the algorithm in some, uh, some universal way, just to, to let it work by itself in computers. So, so this is, this is the k-means, and there is a 
there is a illustration. So the first two columns show, show how it ends up if you use if you use uh, So, so in the row, you always use the individual type of matrix, and in the columns, you use different projection. So, so in the first two columns are what the engineers usually were using, the so-called L projection, that's the one via the harmonics, losing a lot of information. And you see, I, I am all the time working with the same picture, right? So this is the data, the original data. So two crossing curved fibers. And here you see how badly the, the segmentation went for, for the projection. That's typical for curved things. If, if the fibers would be perpendicular and straight, everything would work fine. Once you add some curvature, the second order thing has got problems, right? And the, the last two columns, yeah, and the, the first and second one, are different by the amount of noise, right? So, so in, the, in the second column, it's always a lot of more noise. And the other columns are the novel deprojections, which are quite funny and nice. And they come from, from the following picture. So if you write down the force order tensor approximation, you can imagine it as flattened write it down as a nine by nine matrix with some redundancies so, so only six of the columns and rows would be independent and the others are copies and this comes or it's linked directly to the fact that if you have such a force or the approximation you can consider it as a linear map from s to r3 into s to r3 and, and these guys are six dimensional and if you take some care you find out well if it's if the approximation is done with some special care, you find out that the three diagonal slots will always happen to be SPDs again. So actually you get out of something which has got 15 free parameters, you get something which seems to, to be able to have 18 parameters, but it of course can have only 15 independent ones, but you don't lose any information as a... Uh, Right, and, and then you can take any combination of those three. So for example, if you, if you just take a sum of three positive definite matrices, it will be again positive definite. And this is what was used in the, in the, in the last, in the very last case here, right? So it's the spectrometric and the D components. And you see that this typically decomposes the things properly very nicely, even in highly curved situations. So I'm running a little bit out of my time, but I do not have many, many uh, slides left. I will just touch the other, the other task I referred to, and that's the fiber tracking, right? So, so you want to track the fibers in the, in the white matter. So the idea is here, so there are different approaches, but the idea is we followed is to use some suitable Riemannian metric so that we could hope that the geodesics of that metric would be good approximation of the fibers, right? And of course, there is difficulty with converging and kissing fibers, so you again, definitely will need higher order tensors, not only the second order ones. And a very naive approach at the second order level, so with the DTI modality, so diffusion tensor imaging modality, is the following. So you can see the ellipsoid I'm talking about all the time. And the ellipsoid corresponds to the quadratic form. There are the, the sizes of the principal axis, which I call eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. And there are the principal axes, which are the eigenvectors. So, so the, the, they are just by the matrix left only multiplied by the, by the eigenvalues, right? So those are the principal axes. And if you take a, any power of D, 
And of course, the eigenvectors will remain the same. Only the eigenvalues will be put into power K, right? So if you take the K's power of D and the eigenvalues happen to be lambda one to K, lambda two to K, lambda three to K, and the eigenvectors remain the same. So of course, it suggests that the inverse of D would be the first choice for the right metric because a positive definite symmetric matrix is actually a metric. And what we want to see to have a good hope that the geodesics will be the right curves is that in the direction of the main principal axis, the long one, we should put a very little cost. And in the direction of the other one, we should put a very high cost. So if you take the reciprocal values, it, it's, it's a good start, right? Unfortunately, it's too, too simple. It doesn't work completely. So the people what were trying to do different things. So one of them was to take the algebraic adjoint, the educate matrix instead. So it's something like you take the inverse, but you, you multiply it with the, with the determinant of the original one. Quite good effect, but not over. The biggest eigenvalue will be coming with much smaller cost than the lowest eigenvalue, right? And that can be achieved by taking powers, right? Because if you take second power of the eigenvalues, then of course the difference between them will grow. Uh, that, was, that was called sharpening, right? In the literature. And actually the educate, the educate then uh, metric is there, yeah, I will be finished in a second. The educate, well, actually I started much later, right? Because we had the delay with the previous speaker. Yeah, you, in principle, we are five minutes already over the end. Yeah. So, yeah. so, um, so the, taking the educate means that you simply multiply your metric with some, with some function. And as we heard in Roth's lecture, that's called conformal rescaling of the metric. And here, therefore, it's quite obvious you could try to find a nice conformal rescaling, which will settle the problem. Because what we want to see is that the, that the cost should be very big in any direction, absolutely any direction in the isotropic regions, because you don't want your geodesics to leave the fibers, right? And the solution, the good solution is, or, or we found it was a reasonably good solution, is again to use some, some good activation function based on the Hilbert anisotropy and just employed that, right? And I have, I have just one picture here. So you see, so, so the left column, has got 25% of noise, the right column has got, has got 30% of noise. So if you just show only the anisotropy, you hardly can see where the fibers are, right? With the 30%, you don't see it at all. But the, but the tracking via the geodesics was with reasonably beta scaled version of the, of the second or fourth power, here it's the second, is doing quite well, right? So that's that's roughly what we what we what I tried to explain, and I followed mainly these two papers, and I just want to point out that you see that no way they are in some typical mathematical journal, right? So it's the first one is very recently published in Computer Methods and Programs in Biomedicine. So it's the first quartile paper section of, 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 of journals, except in some completely diverse area. The other one is still visible in mathematics, right? But also it's in first quartile in some other area, not in mathematics. So, and also, of course, it was all based on Sumit's PhD thesis because it was him who, who just brought these topics and con convinced me that it was interesting. And then we had to, to work hard because I never understood what he was doing. So his, his approach to work was that he always came already with something implemented and pictures. And so, well, professor, look, it works. <laughs> and then in the end of the day, we had to go down back, 
backwards and, and until we came to the individual lines in his codes. And, and then sometimes <laughs> even that was not enough and he was not, not doing what he thought. But, but finally it was okay. So, so I hope it was a little bit illuminating. What are the problems? What are the topics? And what are the tools? And that's it. Okay, so thank you very much for the talk. <laughs> now, are there any questions? Many mass tools uh, that you touched can be used uh, not only for study of brains, but for numerous problems of image processing. Sure. So what is a specific mass tools which are namely for brains? Well, I mean, I would, I would rephrase it differently. So actually what we are doing, we haven't invented any brand new method for segmentation or fiber tracking or whatever, but we were trying to enhance and improve the similarity measures and understanding of their behavior. And on top of that, we just added the activation functions just to, to be sure we are only using the parts of the measures we need, right? So, and this is specific for the brain research because it follows just the properties of the tensors you get. So the k-means technique or, or, or the active contour methods, that's all, I don't know, 40, 30 years old methods which work, right? So, so it, it works everywhere. It, it's in material sign, it works in... in, in yeah, but what must be specific for brains? Well, specific pro for brains is the fact that you get these particular kinds of either second or fourth order tensors, and you have to work with, with the voxels instead of pixels. That is not a big difference because anything three dimensional would also have voxels, but the data related with that are specific for the diffusion images. So it means that it is not pre mathematically, it's not principally new methods, but it is just adjusting developed mass methods uh, to brains, right? Sure, sure. That's what I was starting with. I, I was claiming that I will present no new mathematical results, no new methods. I was, we, we are just collecting the tools that people know about to enhance the algorithms to work better. Okay. That's exactly what the math in application should be. And of course, I mean, I mean, there are some novel things in some sense or continuing because, for example, part of the properties when you deal with the fourth order tensor, go back to celebrated paper by David Hilbert, uh, more than 100 years old, saying that every positive semi-definite fourth order tensor, symmetric, can be written as a sum of three squares of quadratic forms, right? And, and this is, for example, very important. What we need is, I mean, to see, for example, that the diagonal components are positive definite. It's a small mathematical result. It's enough to ensure that you will sum only three squares of positive definite quadratic forms. And then it will be positive definite, not semi-definite. And and if you start with that, you are sure that everything works, right? And this can be proved quite easily. So it's a simple, simple observation, right? But for example, just what the people do is they, they of course, numerically doesn't matter whether you have three or more, because typically what you would do is you have a, and that's also the way how, how the, how the, how the approximation of either second or fourth or sixth order or whatever order works, you simply don't work with three quadratic forms. You simply take your favorite, say, I don't know, 81 quadratic forms or, or maybe 170, and all of them will be positive definite. And you simply make the least, least square fit with positive coefficients, which is a a standard toolbox in the MATLAB or wherever. And you simply look what, what are the coefficients, right? And you can, for example, find immediately the category of the voxel, whether it's just a voxel which is isotropic or a voxel which has got just one fiber through or a voxel which has got two or three. So with fourth order, you can't go beyond three, but you can just categorize. And that's the beginning of, of drawing the picture chart, getting right? Because for example, if you track the fiber, and if you come to a region of the category of crossing or merging, you have to employ first some 
decision how to go through the cross and then continue with the fiber pressure. Right, so, so, so this is just a bunch of simple tools, but you have to put them properly uh, together properly. Maybe one more. So are there still some more questions? Maybe also via Zoom. Because if, okay, so if not, then I'm closing the, the morning session. And